here. If you are a fan of the miniseries okay? Band of Brothers, you know that Wild Bill Garnier was shown to be a crazed killer on D-Day. Well, was that true? And how did he cope with losing his leg at Bastogne? Well, I sat down with George Luss Jr. and Gene Garnier, Wild Bill's son, to watch clips from the show and hear if they're yeah, true. Show. Stay. The only thing he told me one time, I said, what was, what's the deal with Bastogne? He said, well, think it is. He said, you're at the football game. The football team's in the middle of the field. There you. He said, everybody in the stands are Germans. <laughs> he said, that's, that's the way he explained it. With the 80th anniversary of D-Day, we have now entered a time when the Second World War has passed from living memory. We cannot hear the stories of the war from the people, like Bill Garnier, who fought through the 20th century's greatest cataclysm. But we can sit down with their sons and daughters and hear what these people were like. Gene Garnier, the oldest son of Wild Bill, is now 78, but he still holds some of his dad's feisty energy. George Luz and I started talking with him about what Wild Bill thought about the miniseries Band of Brothers. Yeah, episode five that Tom Hanks was directing. Yeah. My father and babe were invited over as technical advisors. They were on the scene. Were you there then, George? I went a few months after. George always goes everywhere that they go. So anyway, while they were doing the show, uh, Tom Hanks asked them, is this for, you know, is this correct? This, and I know my dad said, you got to throw more dirt on them. They didn't look dirty enough and so on and so forth. Yeah. So yeah, for, as far as my dad was concerned, there was a, a lot of accuracies, accuracies in the series. Yeah. And he said they added, you know, they, they added some things here and there. And that's part of basically like filling, filling in the small spots. Well, one of the things that people don't realize, if you think about it, and George's father and my father, when they were in Tekoa in 1942, yeah. in, say, June or July in Tekoa, they were in training for two years. Before Bill joined the Army and ended up in Tekoa, he was just an Italian kid from the streets of Philadelphia. That is how he is portrayed the first time we see him in Band of Brothers. We watched it with Gene. My mom was from an Italian family. Both her parents were Italian. My father was from an Italian family. Both his parents were Italian. My both grandfathers were from Italy. My grandmothers were from Philadelphia, not from Philadelphia, from Philadelphia suburbs in Philadelphia. So yes, we were 100% Italian. And gravy, when that was what they gave him, was like ketchup gravy for for Italians in Philadelphia was red gravy. Uh, in other places it was just, you know, brown gravy was for, for, for you know, it was exactly what it was. Yeah. Brown gravy, but it wasn't Italian. Yeah, going to the reunions as a kid, yeah. I've had a lot of opportunities to meet his, uh, his dad and his mom. 
Uh, you know, Mom was an integral part. Franny was an integral part of that because they used to drive to the reunions yes. and they would bring the stinky cheese. Oh, that's your provolone. It was very Italian, provolone and pepperoni. My father bring long sticks of pepperoni and a whole provolone cheese. And then your dad always brought chocolates too, didn't he? Seize candies. Seize candies. From Arizona. So there was always a special treat. Yes, there was. Yes, there was. Because man does not live by privilege, right? <laughs> Hello. Oh, my God. Wild Bill joined all the NCOs in rebelling against Lieutenant Sobel. How did it really go down? And what did Wild Bill really think of Sobel? Help me. So we're going through with this, right? We gotta do something. Yeah. 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 All right. Good. But we'd all better be clear of the consequences. I don't care about the consequences. John. We could be lined up against a wall and shot. I'm ready to face that. And every one of us had better be too. I will not follow that man into combat. Me neither. Let's do it. Hereby, no longer wish to serve as a non-commissioned officer in easy company. to have you all shot. There's nothing less than an act of mutiny while we prepare for the goddamn invasion of Europe. Sergeant Harris. Sir. Turn in your stripes, collect your gear. You are hereby transferred out of my regiment. Sir. Get out. Sergeant Ranny. Sir. You consider yourself lucky I'm only busting you to private. All of you NCOs have disgraced the 101st Airborne. You can consider yourself lucky that we are on the eve of the largest action in the history of warfare, which leaves me no choice but to spare your lives. Now get out of my office and get out of my sight. Get. Bill wrote about how this actually went down in his book. George reads us the passage. In Bill's book, there's a great... A, a great little passage here. It says, in December, the sergeants decided no way we were going into combat with Sobel. We didn't even have time to think about it. We made the decision quick, fast, and done. No one hesitated. We went right to Sobel and turned in our stripes. We stuck together. Sobel couldn't believe it. He couldn't do anything. He ranted and raved and screamed and howled, but he couldn't do anything. What my father said is they weren't sitting around like that writing a letter. What they did is at in formation in the morning, they ripped their, their, their stripes off and they threw them at Sobel. That's what they did. That's what my father told me and I believe him. That's what happened. And for them to, to do this, they could have been shot. All these guys could have been shot for like, it's almost like mutiny. So it must have really been bad for them to do this. He goes, I, I uh, asked my dad about Sobel. My dad said he got along very well with Sobel. And I said, Dad, was this man like this in the movie? He said he was worse, but he was a great trainer. He said he trained us to be good fighting men. And uh, that's the way it was. As Bill prepared for the D-Day drop, he learned that his brother Henry had just been killed in the war.
something you might be looking for. To get jacket by mistake. I'm sorry. You ready? Where the f is Monte Casino? I don't know. At least somewhere. Sorry about your brother, Bill. Sorry for my mom. He was, uh... Let's get this over with. Bill? I'll meet up with you over there. While I was growing up, no, he never talked about that. He had a tattoo. When I was growing up, my father had, I think, four tattoos. Parachute, uh, something else, 506. And then he had this grave site on his arm. And on the grave site, it said dunk. So as I grew up, I'm thinking, well, that probably means, you know, somebody died and they were dunk being a symbol that they were in the grave. And he was being interviewed. <clears throat> and someone was talking about his tattoos. And I was sitting there listening to the interview and they asked him about his tattoos. He said, this one here, Dunk, is from my brother, Henry. And then he said, what do you mean? He said, well, Henry used to like to dunk everything in coffee, milk. He used to like to dunk everything. So his nickname was Dunk. So that was for his brother. But I didn't know that until Band of Brothers. You know, as a kid, you grow up, you don't ask your father what the, what's, the, you know, what's the purpose of this tattoo, what's the meaning of it. And in the series, him and Johnny Martin were in Edinburgh, Scotland, and they got the same tattoo, and that's when my father's remember junk is a skunk, right? Both oh, of them. okay, sure. Yeah. They hung around. They were like they were. Johnny Martin was first platoon sergeant, and my dad was second platoon sergeant. While the war was going on, these these paratroopers they were in training for two years. After training for two years, you you dropped a bunch of lunatics out of the sky. Well, you mm. know, I mean that's the truth. So this is the, uh, the Normandy drop. He said, I had no idea where the hell I was, but it turned out to be St. Mary Glees, a few miles from the drop zone. If you saw the movie The Longest Day, I came down near the church where John Steele's parachute got caught on the steeple. I didn't have a gun, no cricket either. Everything went flying off me when my chute jerked open. He, she showed me the exact spot he landed in. I said, what was this? He said, kid, when I came down, the place was on fire. People were trying to put out this with fire and buckets. He said, I grabbed, he said, I grabbed what I had, and I, and I took the hell off. I started running because there was Germans down there shooting, you know, shooting the paratroopers coming down, and he just took off, you know, and, and, but he showed me the exact spot he, he landed in. When my father jumped, he, he lost his leg bag, right? His, and it, it, he, my father was in this plane. He had his leg bag tied to his, his uh, leg, and he said when he got up, his leg was asleep, and he, he, couldn't, he couldn't stand up, so somebody grabbed him and pushed him out the door. I forget who he mm. said. It might have been Joe Toy. Pushed him out the door. I think it was Joe Toy. And he lost the leg bag. Yeah, it was Joe Toy. He lost the leg bag, and he lost his gun, his rifle. And Joe Toy, when, when Joe Toy went down, he had, the, he had the, the leg bag wrapped around so tight, Joe Toy, mm -hmm. that when it came off, it ripped the skin off his hand. Mm. Joe Toy was so it act, my father said when I, he got down, he said it was all bleeding. He says his skin was ripped off. It ripped it. It pulled the skin off. So, yeah, and then when my father landed, he, all he had was a knife, which he said in the book, and he, there was a guy next to him, and my father took the knife and put it to his neck and said, whose side are you on? And the guy was another paratrooper. But that's, uh, I mean, that's, you know, these guys are then, look, this, they're going to think, they're going to die. They're thinking that they could be dead. They're going to be, you know, somebody's going to shoot them. They heard sure. them picking up the German rifle, the Burma machine gun and, and, and shooting it. 
And then that's, and that's what he did. It was crazy. The series shows Wild Bill and Dick Winters butting heads on D-Day. Let's watch the scene and then hear from Bill himself as George reads from his book. Wait for my command. My command, Sergeant. In the movie, Dick Winters orders us to hold fire, and I started shooting. It happened that way. I don't remember, but it could have. I had so much anger, I might have turned around and shot him if he tried to stop me. I wanted to shoot every German son of a bitch I laid my eyes on. There, That's a good line. There it is, yeah. It was kill or be killed, period. Another thing, I respected Winters as an officer, but no one had proven themselves in combat yet. I didn't know if Winters would kill. He was a Quaker. Mm. <laughs> so. <laughs> Funny thing is, when we were in, uh, I guess we were in Normandy, Dick Winters was there. It might have been Normandy. We were somewhere where Dick Winters, my dad was, maybe it's one of the premieres, and there was a bus. And we we're off the bus and we we're getting on the bus and Dick Winters is standing at the front of the bus and my dad's there with Babe. And Dick Winters says to my father, okay, yeah, Bill, get on the bus. And my father says, yeah, you get on the bus, kid. And Dick Winters says, get on the bus. And my father says, get on the friggin' bus. We ain't good come. So Winters, Winters turns around and he says to him, you never did listen to me. <laughs> and he got on the bus. Yeah, Winters loved him. So that, that was a scene with him and Dick Winters that I was actually, you know, watched as it unfolded. Get on a friggin' bus, kid, he told Dick, and Dick Winters got on a bus. Told him he never listened to me. <laughs> During the famous attack on the German guns at Braycor Manor, Bill covered Don Malarkey as he ran into German fire to try and pick up a Luger as a war souvenir. We played the scene for Gene, and we got a surprising story. I was with Malarkey. And, and that guy, he's a, he, what a hell of a soul he was, John Don. I was, and I, you know, everybody about the Luger, everybody, he always wants Lugers to lose. So I sit and by myself talking to him. And I said, Don, I said, how many Lugers did you ever really get? He said, well, he said, I probably got about 60, right? I said, Don, you're kidding me. I said, I said, he said, yeah, but I took about 40 of them and threw them in the shit, shitter and burned them. I said, why'd you do that? He said, so the officers didn't get them. I mean, this is, these guys were, look, they look, they're standing on Hitler's car, they were in the Eagle's Nest, they were all over the place, this stuff that they could grab, but you know, how much stuff could you take with you? My dad, Johnny Martin, took my father's machine gun home, his 30 caliber machine gun, and because Johnny's brother, for something to do with the Navy, or I don't know, he took it home for him, because my dad was in an airplane, again, and Johnny Martin brought it home, and my father had this machine gun in the basement, so my mother wasn't going for that. She didn't want a 30 caliber machine gun in the basement for her two boys, me and my brother. So she gave it to the German neighbor, Schicklin, across the street. My dad gave it to him, and we never saw it again. But she didn't want it in the house. That simple. Hmm. Yeah, you wonder where that is today. I know, I know. But, uh... When the series moved to Holland, we don't see too much of Wild Bill. Now, unless you did a close watching of episodes five and seven, you what? might have missed the fact that Wild Bill was on, wounded him, in Holland. Bill mentions wow, it when he and Babe are talking day. about Buck Compton's battle fatigue in Bastogne. When getting shot, that guard of it was being in that hospital. I've been there, okay? It ain't pretty. Holland. He gets shot in the lake. And he gets blown off the motorcycle by a sniper. And uh, he goes to the hospital. So now he's in the hospital, and he's a feisty guy. His leg is healing or whatever, and he has a, a, a cast on. So he paints the cast black, to, or whatever, he, to make it look like a boot. And he even had, I think he even had a wooden pistol or something ridiculous with him. 
So he snuck out. Now he snuck out, but he's limping. He sneaks out of there. He's going to go back to the company. So they catch him. And they bring him back to the hospital. And he says, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to go out again anyway. So they fix him up, get his cast off or whatever, and they send him back. But in the process, they break him to private. So he's a sergeant, platoon sergeant, you know, three, stri- two, two, three stripes. And he's going to, two stripes, he's going to leave and he's going to go back. Maybe one stripe, whatever. He's a, he's a staff sergeant. So they press him to, to a sergeant, to a private, and he goes back. And that's when the winter sees him. He says, welcome back. You know where Lulu's is. Right? So mm-hmm. Now he puts yeah. him back in second platoon as a sergeant. Now that doesn't mean anything until he's in his 50s when he can't work anymore and he's trying to get his pension as a sergeant full prevention and he him and my mom fought for five years because they wanted to, they, all that whole time I think when he was getting disability he was getting it as a private wow well that's what I'm saying he was when he got out he was because they had him as a private wow. and you know because okay. because people don't know what, what's going on they don't realize that's what they got you know in fact my mother thanked me one time when I was 18 uh, they cut the pension eight dollars and she looked me in the eye. She said, oh, you have a lot of guts. I said, why? She said, you just cost me $8 by turning 18. That was $8 a month for, you know, for me. But that's so, and then finally he got 100% disability as a staff sergeant. Bill's next wound is depicted famously in episode seven, when Joe Toy and him are hit during an artillery barrage in Bastogne, both of them losing their legs. This is the last time we will see Wild Bill in the show. Come on, Joe. Incoming! HBO offered my father HBO in his house. He told him to get lost, you know, even though he wasn't going to pay for it. So he came up my house every Sunday to watch this show. And this scene here, uh, we all watched it, and I really didn't realize how he lost his leg until I saw the scene. I knew he lost it, you know, in Bastogne. And people said, were you upset I said, I wasn't so upset as maybe other people watching the series because they looked at one of the characters of the series, oh, my God, he lost his leg, and they didn't realize he was going to lose. I knew he lost his leg. Uh, my kids were a little upset looking at it because it was reality for them. You know, they were younger. But uh, for me, he was, he was here. So if he, if he didn't make it, I wouldn't have been here. So it wasn't as emotional for me. It was an emotional scene. And a lot of people got upset about this, him and both of them guys being lost in one shot, just like McCall and, and Muck in the, in the you know, mm-hmm. getting, getting hit in the, in the hole there. But, uh, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a tough scene to watch. And for people that, you know, you build characters up in the series. And my dad was one of the main characters in the series, and Joe, and all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're both out. A lot of guys got moved out of this series. You know, during episode seven. The funny story is my brother, uh, well, my dad had a heart attack and we went to the hospital. We took him to the hospital and the doctor asked my brother, I said, when did your dad lose his leg? And my brother told him episode seven. (laughs) That's that's pretty good, I thought, you know. So that was, but yeah, episode seven. And then the nurse, when our dad was in the hospital, asked him, when, when, when's the last time? He asked my doctor, true story, when's the last time you saw the doctor? He said, Doc Rowe in Bastogne. Because he didn't go to the doctor. These people didn't go to the doctor. They didn't do any of this stuff. They self-mended. My father broke his finger. He said, it's a good kid. It was bent. When he had a heart attack, he told me that he had a massage sandwich. It was just, you know, gas, kid, I'm all right. But they didn't, they did never, they didn't address stuff like we do today. They just moved on. A testament to Bill's toughness is the fact that he was awake during his leg amputation surgery, and he described the scene in his book. 
take off whatever was left below the mid thigh. You're wide awake when they do the operation. They numb you, but you're awake. They were at the end of the operation. The doctor reached up with, to grab a saw, like we were in a butcher shop. Mm-hmm. I thought, holy cow. They said they were going to trim the bone. I said to the nurse, put your hands on my scadonis <laughs> so they don't saw them off. Everybody laughed, but she did. I never forget her. A little nurse from Boston named Rose Kramer. Yeah. I mean, that's it. I, I mean, yeah, he told me, he said, they just cut it, cut it off with a saw, kid. I mean, like, this is like nonchalantly. And then because they cut it below the knee, when he went home, he had, he had gangrene, and they had to cut it above the knee. So he wore this wooden leg. And I'll tell you a little bit about the wooden leg if you want to know about that. The wooden leg was made of solid maple. It was hollow, I mean solid, but it was, the leg was probably about, well, maybe about an inch and a half thick all the way around. And he had a little valve in the, in the leg, and he wore a stump sock. And the stump sock was about, maybe about this long, you know, maybe two, two and a half feet long. And it was open at both ends. And he would put the stump sock over his stump and pull the bottom out, pull the leg up, pull the bottom of the stump sock and put it through the valve the leg all the way in place and pull the stump sock out and tighten the valve. So uh, as a kid, I didn't think anything of that. That's the way you put your leg on. But as I got older, I'm thinking, this is a vacuum. He's walking around with a vacuum on his leg the whole day. He went to work, he drove, he did everything the whole day. And uh, that's just what he did. He did never, it was no straps, buckles, hooks, nothing. He just put his leg on. Because my brother and I would have the, the, uh, the luxury of carrying his leg down from upstairs if he didn't, you know, if he, it was upstairs. Because he would go upstairs. He would come down, when he'd come down the steps, he would hold on to the wall and he would hop down three or four steps at a time. I'm surprised the steps never broke because it made so much. He was taking his body, 150 pounds, boom, 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 three shots and he's down a step and he would hop over to the couch and get my leg, kid. And then that would be the, the end of the story. But that's, mm. that's what he did. That's the way. So you're, we were used to it because... We lived with him, and it didn't really mean anything to us. Bill stayed connected to Easy Company for the rest of his life, organizing reunions every year. Here's what he wrote about what reunions meant to him and the other men. This is the reunions and the memories of war. When the men get together, nobody talks much about the war. We talk about our families and what we're doing. If something comes up that has to do with the war, we look at each other. We don't have to say a word. We give it a, give a guy a hug or a squeeze. It's, it's understood. You were both there and you both know. If you're a combat veteran, war never leaves you. Every Christmas you spend, you spend in Bastogne. Whether or not, you spend it there. It's on your mind, body and soul. In September, you think of Holland too, but it's not got the same charge as Bastogne. That was the most haunting part of the war. What happens there remains inside every one of us. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was talking about before Christmas. One Christmas, and it happened, I, this is the Christmas that I saw it, but it's happened more than once. We were in the kitchen, me, my dad, and my mom, maybe my brother, and my father picked up his plate of, this is in December, he picks up his plate of f- f- food and throws it against the wall, and the, the plate blows up, the food flies all over the place, and he gets up and he leaves the room. So I'm a, I'm a young kid, uh, it kind of scared me that he threw the plate against the wall, but I wasn't afraid of, of him. So I said to my mom, I said, what's with that? What's, what, is, what happened with him? And she said, he gets like that every Christmas. He gets upset. So these are the demons he held inside of him that I never experienced personally and he never talked about anything. I never heard him screaming in the middle of the night. I mean, like, you know, I never, but these are the things that, the the, the stuff that 
rumbled inside of these these men. I mean, Don Malarkey, any time Don Malarkey cried, he would go into tears, Don. He would be so mm. upset. In the series, when I asked about my dad and Joe Toy, he says, I can't talk about it. And he's ready to... Johnny Martin, you could see him break up in, in, in tears a little bit. Because it's hard for these men to talk about these experiences that they had because they're so terrible. You know, like, uh, the, the killing just... You know, you actually... They took the people, they killed the... the you know, they actually killed people. They did a lot of stuff that the normal person wouldn't think of doing. You know, so that's that's part of it. So after the war, yeah, he, uh, I mean, he survived well. He kept all his emotions in check. Uh, you couldn't cross him and, and get away with it. He was, uh, he was a pretty, but he was a good guy. He would help you. He would give anything away. He didn't have money, and what little money he had, he give away. It's the same thing when I do with George. It's a simple thing. You're a good man. Well, you know, your dad had a uh, tough exterior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. A very soft yeah, ab interior. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, when I, when I got out of high school, my dad didn't have much money, so I didn't, I didn't go to college. But when I got out of school, I was 17, 1964, and my father, this is the whole conversation I had. He said, a kid, would you like to go to West Point or Annapolis? Now, this is a God's honest truth. I never heard of West Point or Annapolis. So my first answer was, no, nah, I don't want to do that. He said, all right, kid, get a job. There was no today. They'd be driving me to West Point, giving me interviews, looking at student loans. There was none of that back in the 60s. So you said you didn't want to do it. Hey, it's good enough for me. My mother didn't say nothing. <laughs> Whatever he said, that was the end of that. So this is that, the way that generation was. I'm sure that you know, your dad was similar. That's just the way they were. You made your own decisions. They made you grow. It's like chickens. Get out of the nest. You're on your own. So I got a job. I, when I went to Vietnam, I got drafted anyway. But And I joined a paratrooper, not because he was in a paratrooper. At 19, he said, it's a great thing to do. Mm, mm. Stupid as a rock, but it was a lot of fun. Mm. And I was, I was okay with that. He was okay with that. You know, and uh, we just moved on. But yeah, the last 20, the, the, probably the last 15 years of his life, uh, 17 years without my mom, Mm -hmm. I was his plus one, so I really became a lot closer to him. It was pretty cool. He was no low maintenance. He, he didn't. He wouldn't move in with anybody. He would go out and eat all the time. Right? <laughs> he, he, he even talked to George. You know, you had little reunions and stuff. He did everything. Him and Babe, and Babe lived by himself, and they just hung around together. They went all over the place. They just went to schools. So they did everything together. So, but thank you for having us here today. And thank you for writing. And, you know, inviting my compadre, George, the Hammer Luss. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, George does have a website if anybody's interested. And w can I show that picture real quick? Yeah. Give me the bottom one, the bottom picture there. Yeah. I knew this kid would do something. This. Thanks, so. You can get in this if you want. This is a, this is, is this, we still running here? This is a print my dad had made. And... The reason I just had, this is from a real picture taken in Margrotten in Holland. This is a real picture taken in 1987. He's carrying a list of graves and flowers. And he's on one lake. So this is his dedication to veterans. And this says it all.